Have you ever disappointed somebody you love? <laughs> Done something that maybe they didn't like. Okay, I have this thing. I'm sorry. When, when we've got like french fries or something like that that we're sharing and we get to the, to the last, but I really hate to be the one that eats the last one and then to see Debbie look like, oh, I wanted one. Now, she, ne she never makes me feel bad, but I feel bad. It's something inside of me that just, like, I don't want to be the one that eats the last one, especially if she wanted it, if it's the last chocolate chip cookie, whatever it might be. But let's be honest about it. I have disappointed Debbie a lot worse than eating the last pie. Have you ever been in a fight with your spouse and you knew it was your fault? <laughs> Did you disappoint them then? Have you ever done something that hurt them? Or think of this, did you ever disappoint a parent? Mother, father? By some decision, some stupid choice you made. You ever had somebody that you love disappoint you? We're going to look at that today as we look at the life of one of the most important disciples, one of the most important apostles, the life of Peter. <coughs> I probably need to back up in the story a little bit be, before we get to the text that I want to look at this morning. Um, in fact, in, Jesus has risen from the dead. He's come out by the lake. Uh, and Mark 16 says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm backing up even farther. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Don't be, don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. And then the incredible announcement. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Did you catch the very personal introduction that the angels make? Jesus the Nazarene's not here, but go tell his disciples and Peter. It's very important that Jesus gets the word out. The angels are even announcing it. God is concerned about Peter. Why is he concerned about Peter? Well, because Peter has denied Jesus three times in a public forum and left crying. Peter is very distraught about what he did by rejecting, by denying, by saying he didn't believe in Jesus Christ, that he didn't even know him. He's humbled by his denial. In fact, couldn't we even say broken by it? I mean, he is extremely disturbed by the fact that he did not stand up and say, yes, I'm a Jesus follower. Yes, I'm one of his. Instead, he said, no, I'm not. And he actually cusses as he's doing it the final time. Now it's a week later or more. Jesus has revealed himself to the disciples at least once, probably a couple of times already. And in John 21, Jesus is beside the water. They don't know who it is, but there's a man off there at the side, and he says, throw your nets onto the right side of the boat. And then, oh, we've been fishing all night long. We haven't caught anything. We're worn out. Come on. So, so they throw their nets over, and the nets fill up, and they're about to burst the boats and the nets and everything. And Peter realizes, that's got to be Jesus over there who just told us to do this. Peter jumps in the water, heads to shore. The other disciples come on in, and now they have this incredible breakfast with Jesus. <clears throat> I 
I want to show you some pictures, so go ahead and let's start clicking through here. This is actually a church now where um, the rock it's that Jesus supposedly stood on when he hollered out to Peter and the disciples, uh, throw your nets on the right side of the boat. It's right at the edge of the Sea of Galilee, as you probably have heard. Many of the special locations in Israel now have churches over them, and this is one of them. Next slide, please. This is outside, though. And now as you look outside, you say, oh, there's other rocks out there, too. And they actually would do this. People would actually stand on the shore, and when men were fishing out in the lake, they would actually, because they'd be standing up on these rocks, they're higher than the water, they can see, and they can see dark areas in the lake, and they say, the fish are over there. You need to throw your nets over there because that's where the fish are. They can see the schools of fish just because of the darkness in the water. Next slide, please. Another, another picture, of, that's the church, by the way. This is now taken from down between the rocks and the water. But as you can see, you can be up fairly high to see. Next slide. Uh, this. <laughs> if you would have been quiet, they wouldn't have known it was you. <laughs> hey, she's always telling me, show pictures of Israel. So, okay. This is, this is straight out from those rocks and where that, that rock that's underneath that chapel. This is straight out from there. This is, out here is where, Jesus, where the disciples would have been fishing. Oh, uh, and this is probably the spot where Peter, next slide please, where Peter comes in, swims in the shore. And here's the amazing thing. There's these rocks that are in the ground there as well. Take a look at it. Next slide. Look at yeah. what these lo- rocks look like. The rocks that are there in the beach where Jesus met with with Peter, they actually look like a heart. Who knows how they got shaped that way. This is the shore where Peter and Jesus walk away after breakfast. And Jesus is going to have that incredible conversation that's all meant to restore Peter because Peter had disappointed him deeply. And Jesus is going to ask him, you denied me three times? He's going to ask him, do you love me three times? Early in the morning. Let's, let's move forward. So John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to him to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. So think back, have you disappointed somebody that you loved? Did you disappoint somebody as much as Peter disappointed Jesus? And really, when you think about Peter's disappointment, I'm not sure that it wasn't Peter who felt the worst about this, maybe even more so than Jesus. Perhaps you felt like you couldn't win the approval of parents that you loved. And every, every child, whether you like your parent or not, wants their approval wants to be appreciated, valued, wants to be told, I love you, you've done well. And unfortunately, some parents don't know how to say that. In fact, some parents say quite the opposite. But do you remember what happened as Peter's there in, in the garden, in, excuse me, in the, in the courtyard of the high priest? He's come there with only one other disciple, The two of them have followed Jesus, who's been arrested. They've been taken to the high priest, and he's going to, there is where the beating's going to start. The false trial's going to be taking place at the, at the, it's actually the father of the high priest, and then he'll go on to the high priest's house. 
He's the former high priest. And, and, and Peter's there watching this trial and basically hiding because he wants to see what's going to happen to Jesus. And what happens? Three different times. One of them is actually a relative of, of the friend who got his ear, of, of, the, of the cousin who got his ear cut off. Who cut the ear off of one of the people? It was Peter who did it. Peter's the one who's got one of the two knives with them, one of the two daggers. Peter draws it out. I'm going to stand with you, Jesus. I'm going to protect you. S- grabs and reaches out, strikes at that, at that soldier that's there, that guard, if you will, and cuts off his ear. And Jesus heals him. And now Peter has been in this place basically like an undercover spy. I mean, really, sometimes we think of him, oh, he's just a wimp. He he just didn't stand up for Jesus. It took courage for him to be in that place. It took courage for him to stand by the the very people who had just arrested Jesus. It took courage for him to stand at that fire and even to have that servant girl come up to him, hey, hey, aren't you one of those Galilean guys? Oh, no, no, not me. I don't know him. It took courage for him to remain in that place when asked a second time, hey, I'm sure you are. Oh, you sound like them. You're one of them. No, no, not me. And then when the third person, and now this is the guy who's a relative of the guy just who Peter knows, I cut, I cut his cousin's ear off. I'm certain of it. You were there in the garden. You're one of them. No, and now he cusses. And he swears that he never knew Jesus And in that moment, it's one of those painful, painful moments. Have you ever looked in the eye of the person you disappointed? You disappointed them, and and you really, you did something wrong. You disappointed them by your actions. It's not their fault at all. Have you looked in that eye and seen the pain? Because that's what Peter does. He hears the rooster. He looks across the courtyard where they're abusing Jesus. And they see eye to eye. And what does Peter do? He runs away weeping. Jesus has just asked him now, a week and a half later, He's risen from the dead. Peter should be excited, shouldn't he? Man, the master's alive again. Yes, the master who, who, who died on that cross is alive again. This is wonderful. The master who I denied three times, and he looked me in the eye when I did it. You see, Peter, with Jesus alive, is maybe more broken than with him being dead. Because Peter knows, I I told him I would be there for him. I told him there's no way I would deny him. There's no way I would do that. I told him I would give my life for him. And in the thick of it, when things got really bad, I blew it. Peter knows that his dis- the disappointment that he caused Jesus is all because of his actions, not Peter, not Jesus. It's all his fault. And Jesus is here trying to deal with a broken soldier. John says immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Incidentally, the authorities say there's only one way we know this story. There's only one person who watched it happen other than Jesus. Who was it? Peter. The only way way we know that Peter rejected Jesus, denied him, and then looks Jesus in the the only way we know that is because Peter told the story. John 13, Peter asked, Lord, Why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. John MacArthur talked about this passage. He said, You want to follow close. If you're Peter, you you want to be right there. You want to be close. You want to stay close to Jesus. 
You've boasted too much. You've listened too little, prayed too little, acted too fast, followed too far, and as a result, you fall too low. It's the darkest hour in human history. It's hell's hour. Jesus is on trial, about to be executed, and Peter is no match for the forces of hell. And when we boast too much, and we listen too little, and we pray too little, and we act too fast, we too may fall too low like Peter. And what did Peter do? When he remembered what Jesus said, he broke down and wept. While Peter was below in the courtyard, this is from Mark, Mark 14, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were at the Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went in and out into the entryway. Got to get away from her. When the servant girl saw him there, she comes up to him again, to, to those surrounding, said, this, is, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them. You are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken him before the rooster crows twice. You will disown me three times, and he broke down and wept. Peter remembers the words of Jesus Christ. But it's too late to help him. One of the things I think we need to catch from Peter's experience is when we remember the word, it might break us. When you've sinned and you've known you've blown it, even though God forgives and God, God cares and God forgets our sin, guess who remembers our sin? We do. We do. And our de denial today may be subtle in its approach. We don't have, we're not in a courtyard with Jesus across the court. But we subtly deny Jesus today too. Are you one of his disciples? Well, I don't want to pray in public so people see me. I, I don't want to offend anyone with talking to them about Jesus, politically correct. And besides, they're probably not really interested in God anyways. And, and frankly, right now, I've just got, I'm too busy. I've got too much else I have to do. And if you think about it, every one of those is a subtle denial of Jesus Christ. Psalm 119.11 says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. When we remember the word of God, it might break us. And without sounding mean, folks, our sin should break us. Our sin should bother us. And, and frankly, it may be bothering you more than you realize. Psalm 32 says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long for day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Sometimes stuff going on inside is because of our sin. Or Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2 says, Oh, blessed is one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and, whose sin, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Verse 5 says, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Or Psalm 51, Against you, you only have I sinned. Have I and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, you will not despise. Our sin should break us. Our sin should have an effect on us. And if you're, if you're sinning and you know it and it's not affecting you, something's wrong. <laughs> You've built a callus on your heart where you no longer care about Jesus. One of the things that I see in, these, in this whole story, though, is, is that, have you ever noticed, God's not trying to keep us from fun. 
God's trying to keep us from pain. So he warns us ahead of time not to do something. He tries to give us directions like the Ten Commandments to try to say, look, follow these and, and things will go well with you. But if you don't follow these, these are really instructions for life. If you don't follow these, you're going to be broken and you're going to hurt. John 18, meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear... Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? He might as well have said, where's the knife? Do you have it with you right now? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. And Luke says, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept it bitterly. And even, even while Jesus is over here being beaten and tried for his sin, the rooster crows. And Peter is starting to feel it. And Jesus looks at him in the eye. Have you ever thought about what that look looked like? There's Jesus. You look at him across from wherever you're at right now. You're Peter. You've just said, I don't know the man. You've cursed out loud. You've totally said, I, I have nothing to do with him. And now your eyes meet. Have you ever thought about what the look looked like? As Jesus was looking at you and, and, and looking across the room there, was it one of anger? Like oftentimes it might be with a parent. <laughs> was it one of disgust? Oh, you blew it again, you, you know, loud mouth, fast talker. You, you, you're, just not, you're just irresponsible. What was the look? Was it a look of love? Was it a look of disappointment, but a disappointment not in Peter, but a disappointment that Peter had just suffered? Was there a sadness that went across Jesus' face? I want to show you a clip from a movie, um, and I'm going to warn you right now, um, the, the movie is Hacksaw Ridge. The clip, uh, and, and the movie is rated R, and why is it rated R? Because it's got battle scene images, and there are being some of those that are going to come out in the clip. This is a, a preview of the movie Hacksaw Ridge. Uh, please watch. What the hell is your delay, Captain? We're waiting, sir. Waiting for what? Private Doss. Who the hell is Private Doss? I was dreaming about being a doctor, but I uh, didn't get much school. I can't stay here while all them go fight for me. Don't you figure this war is just going to fit in with your ideas? While everybody else is taking life, I'm going to be saving it. And that's going to be my way to serve. This is a personal gift from the United States government designed to bring death to the enemy. Oh, I'm sorry, Sergeant. I can't touch a gun. She don't kill. No, sir. You know, quite a bit of killing does occur in war. Private Doss does not believe in violence. Do not look to him to save you on the battlefield. I don't think this is a question of religion. I think this is cowardice. I'll fall in love with you because you weren't like anyone else. You're saying you could go to prison. I don't know how I'm gonna live with myself if I don't stay true to what I believe. With the world so set on tearing itself apart, it doesn't seem like such a bad thing to me to want to put a little bit of it back together. Private Doss, you are free to run into the hellfire of battle without a single weapon to protect yourself.
I don't think that Peter was a coward. I think he was in that place that was very difficult to be because he wasn't a coward. And now Jesus wants desperately to restore him. The story of Desmond Doss is a story about a conscientious objector who had experienced something with a gun where he had taken man's life, his father's, and he said, I'll never shoot a gun again. Excuse me. In his, whole, in his experience, he decides, I'm not going to take a life. A military court tries to court-martial him. You heard part of it there. It says, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, I took it personal. Everyone I knew was on fire to join up, including me. Why I had a job and a defense plant, and I couldn't have taken a deferment, but that ain't right. It isn't right that other men should fight and die, that I would just be sitting at home safe. I need to serve. I got the energy and the passion to serve as a medic right in the middle with the other guys. No less danger, just while everybody else is taking life, I'm going to be saving it. With the world so set on tearing itself apart, it doesn't seem like such a bad thing to me to want to put a little bit of it back together. There's an important scene that's missing from that preview. Intent on wanting to see Doss kicked out of the army, Captain Glover is a part of the court-martial to try to throw him out. As you saw up there, that that fight was horrible. It's on Okinawa, Hacksaw Ridge. Hundreds, thousands of people died on that ridge trying to take it for... Sometimes you wonder for what. But Doss actually rescued 75 men that night. The rest of the army had been told to pull back Doss stayed up on the top of Hacksaw Ridge. The Japanese are there around. He had to hide from them. He had to hide soldiers from them. He rescued 75 men and lowered them by rope with his own hands down to the ground, down that cliff that you saw. He personally did that. Later, Captain Glover comes to him. says you did an incredible act of courage young man I'm sorry all I saw was a skinny kid I didn't know who you were you've done more than any other man could have done in the service of his country now I've never been more wrong about someone in my life and I hope one day you can forgive me What's amazing is after that, the captain says, son, the men won't go, and they're ordered back up on the hill for another assault. And there's been multiple assaults and multiple platoons that have gone up there, and they're ordered back up on the hill for another assault. It will be the one that, if they do it, they'll actually finally take the ridge. They're ordered to back up on the hill. And captain says, son, I know you just went through hell last night, but you need to go back up. Because the men won't go up without you. So the scene that you saw there in the opening part, and by the way, this is a true story, folks. The scene that you see there in the opening part, who the H is Private Doss? (laughs) It's because the men are waiting there for him to pray. Some of the same men who had beat him up and and who called him coward. You heard the young man. This, this is happening because of the coward. <laughs> this is no coward. This is a man who was courageous who went onto the battlefield. Someday, someday I hope you'll forgive me. Jesus longs to restore Peter. He wants him to bring, to bring him back to a place of forgiveness. He wants that courageous soldier to get back on the battlefield. He doesn't want him to give up. And to do that, he has to sit down with him. He walks along the shore after breakfast, and he says, Simon, do you love me? And Peter will respond in an unusual way. He'll respond, yes, Lord, you know that I like you. 
If you look at the Greek text, you'll find out that Jesus uses the word agape. Simon, do you have agape love for me? Are you willing to sacrifice yourself for me, Simon? And Simon says, I, I've got a phileo, a brotherly love for you. I like you. And you see, the Greek uses different words for love. Agape, self-sacrificing love. It's the unconditional love of God. Phileo love, it's brotherly love. You've heard of the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, phileo. And then there's eros, which is that more erotic kind of love. And he says, do, do, you, do you agape me? He said, now feed my, feed my lambs. Jesus will ask him the second time, Peter, do you love me? Once again, Peter will say, I like you. You know I like you. A third time, Jesus will ask, Peter, do you like me? He steps down to the level of the words that Peter is comfortable with. He says, do you, do you really, do you phileo me? Peter's upset because Jesus asked him a third time, do you, do you love me? But Jesus knows that Peter's got to walk this little path right now because of his own brokenness, his own shame, his own disappointment. And Jesus desperately wants to bring him back to restoration. Did you catch that, that moment? With the, with the ladies at the tomb? Go back and tell my disciples and Peter. Jesus has been planning this all the, this, throughout this process that he has to restore Peter. He says, I want you to feed my sheep. That's why he's doing this. Peter has this responsibility. He's supposed to help lead the church in feeding the nations and feeding the world with the message of Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming to him and he says, Peter, I've got to set you free from the guilt that you're feeling. This shame and guilt is going to keep you from being able to serve and being able to be, uh, to be able to, to have joy and be able to be free. Luke 22, Simon, Simon, same, si Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus is talking to him before he's actually been arrested. And he's saying, Peter, I know you're going to blow it. I know you're going to fail. I'm not holding that against you, Peter. But in fact, Peter, once you come back, here's what I want you to do. I want you to strengthen the brothers. I want to restore you, Peter. And he tells him ahead of time, I want to restore you so you can strengthen the brothers. <laughs> The opening scene on the trailer to Hacksaw Ridge was just after. The captain says, I hope someday you'll forgive me. Some of us have disappointed someone else or someone has disappointed us. And I hope someday you'll forgive them. Because just like Peter, God knows that there are people you might be holding things against and they need to be set free. And God may know that you feel like you've disappointed somebody and you need to be set free. One of the reasons why I sh chose Peter is because we're looking at witnesses of the resurrection. Peter is an incredible witness for the resurrection, isn't he? Acts 2. Verse 36, therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. What did Jesus say to Peter? He said, Peter, after you come back, you're going to strengthen the church. You're going to strengthen the brothers. And in fact, what else did Jesus say? When he's walking along that beach and he says, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, take care of my lambs. He says, okay, Peter, there's a day coming. It's going to be a day where someone else is going to dress you. And they're going to do something to you. And they're going to hang you in a way that you, and do something to you you don't want. And he says he was referring to what? How he was going to die. And remember how Peter dies? 
on a cross. But because Peter felt unworthy to die in the same manner that Jesus died, you remember how he died? He asked them to hang him upside down. He said, I, I can't. I, you're going to put me on a cross? Fine. Because I'll take that cross. I'm following Jesus. I'm not afraid because I know he's risen from the dead. I know I'm going to see him. He already promised that. He is willing to go through this horrible experience. Why? And he says, but hang me upside down because I'm not worthy to die the way my master died, the way Savior died. And Jesus restores Peter. And I guess as I was thinking about this, uh, I think first off, if you need proof that Jesus has risen from the dead, look at Paul, at Paul, look at Peter, look at each of the disciples, every one of them that we're looking at. Incredible life change. Why would Peter just weeks later be standing up in front of the same guys that had crucified Christ and say, you guys crucified him. It's your fault. You're to blame. Because of the courage that he gained from seeing the risen Christ. His life is changed because he saw the risen Christ. Do you believe that? Do you believe in the resurrection? Because here's evidence. In fact, it's incontrovertible proof that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. But maybe the way we need to apply this this morning is this. Do you need forgiveness? Have you disappointed someone? Have you disappointed Jesus? And do you need forgiveness today? Do you need to allow Jesus to say, do you love me? Do you love me? Really, do you like me? And have you finally affirmed what he's asking you? Do you need the forgiveness of Jesus Christ? Do you need to face your disappointments? Some way you've disappointed God. Some of us, as we get older, we kind of look back and there's things that, so some of, right? Sometimes you can look back and you know, oh man, I really messed up. If I had done it different back then, <laughs> and, and, and notice to those of you who are younger, it's one of the reasons why old people, you know, why we do this to you, right? You know, don't do what I did, right? <laughs> we want you to avoid the pain that, we've, that we experience. We don't want you to do the fa same failures that we had. We don't want you to fall into the same addictions, whatever else it might be. We want you to be free. We want you to not experience what, what we did. And yet, do you have disappointments that you need to face today? Because just like Jesus wanted to restore Peter, what I heard Jesus say for us this week is he wants to restore you. And no, take note, he says, when you've come back, then strengthen the brothers. Because here's the other thing that happens. When Jesus restores us, he restores our relationships. And so do you have relationships that Jesus is saying, I want to forgive you and I want to restore your relationships? Because he wants us to give those to him. Let's pray. You know what? Before you bow your heads, there's something I got to tell you also. Calvin's here because uh, we celebrated the life of John Bruce Eric Williams. Does anybody know who that is? I called him Big John. I think you called him Johnny B, right? So how, how he introduced himself as Johnny B. He used to sit in the back of the room. He had cowboy boots that he always wore. He, he, um, he had a cowboy hat that he, that he wore. Um, um, took it off during worship, but, he, but you, we, we knew him for that cowboy hat, right? In fact, um, there's John, big John, with, with his cowboy hat. Yesterday at the memorial, I met Trayvon, his son. And and I had the privilege of saying a few comments about, about Big John. And then not long after that, his son Trayvon got up. And Trayvon said, I'm mad and I'm sad. <clears throat> Big John was a lot sicker than people realized. And, and a couple of different times had almost died and came back and had been away. Of, John, where you been? Uh, oh, well, I was in the hospital. <laughs> would, would never tell us. And we'd, but... But his son had asked him to come live with him this last year. Uh, his dad was divorced a couple different times, so the relationship had always been somewhat distant. But Trayvon wanted dad to come live with him, and dad told him no. And he was upset. He said, I'm, I'm mad because I didn't get to have the time with dad that I wish I had had. And I'm sad because I didn't get to have the time with dad like I wish I had had. 
Big John came up here and he said, you know, I, I need to be up here because I had to get away from Los Angeles because I had demons down there. I had friends down there and people down there and stuff that I did down there. And I had to just get away from it. And so that's what he moved to Crestline some, just a few years back and, and attended our worship here. And I got thinking about that fact that look at, what, look at Trayvon because th- what Trayvon then said to everyone there at the funeral, he says, we got to do better. Folks, we got to do better. When Jesus calls you back to him, when Jesus restores you, he restores you, and he wants to restore your relationships with other people as well. And what Trayvon said yesterday is a word for us today. We got to do better. For us to take care of one another. To maybe open up when we want to kind of be the tough man and not let anyone else know what we're going through. We got to do better. So that somebody's not at our funeral saying, I'm mad and I'm sad. God wants to restore relationships as first the relationship with him, then secondly our relationships with others. Folks, we got to do better. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for people like oh, Private Doss and the, the, the witness that he had, the lives he saved on that on Hacksaw Ridge. Just unbelievable, God. Thank you for his testimony. Jesus, thank you for Peter, for what he faced, even there in that courtyard when he was, saw you and broke down and wept. Thank you for restoring him. Thank you, Lord, for empowering him with a faith that drove him to live for you every day, to suffer regardless of the consequences, ultimately to die on a cross like you. Thank you for Peter and the evidence of your resurrection. And thank you, God, for saving him and healing him and forgiving him so that he again could strengthen others. Do the same thing for us today, Jesus. There, some of us here just need your forgiveness. And, and it's not that you're not willing to give it, it's that we need to accept it. Like Peter, he was still broken and hurting and, and needed to be restored. There are people in this room that need to be restored, Jesus. That need to know that you're saying I love you and I've called you back to me and now you go feed other people. There's people that need to have their lives dramatically changed from the place of disappointment and brokenness and shame to a place of joy and freedom and courage. And may you do that today, Holy Spirit. Have your way in us this day. In Jesus' name, amen.